very much for joining us for this, our, our third session of our Day of Dialogue events. This event is about reproductive justice during the COVID pandemic. And as infection rates surge and more people are without jobs than they were a year ago, and we face Supreme Court challenges to the Affordable Care Act, a few topics seem more timely. My name is Phil Dalton. I'm a professor of rhetoric and public advocacy here at Hofstra, as well as the director of the Center for Civic Engagement. The Center for Civic Engagement's mission is extraordinarily important at this moment in time. It is one of encouraging students to take an active role in their communities and to foster broader national and international dialogue. I believe the, the substance of the present discussion is just as important as participating in it and listening to others and learning to disagree without being disagreeable. The, the present event could not have been possible without the support of various people in offices. The, the Center for Civic Engagement is grateful to the provost's office for its continued support, as well as university relations. And additionally, we are indebted to executive director of the Hofstra Cultural Center, Athleen Collins, for all the work she's invested in today's events. Uh, we're additionally thankful to the center's graduate assistant for civic literacy on, and on campus events, Callie Wynn. And I should also recognize uh, the center's fellows who've been instrumental in conceiving events, uh, helping market them and administer them today. Uh, we couldn't have held this event without any of you. And in just a moment, I'll hand things over to our moderator, Assistant Professor of History, Katrina Sims. And just before I do, I ask you to consider following the link that I'll post in the chat in just a moment. It's a link to the various events we're holding today. Please look at it when you have a moment and uh, consider RSVPing and joining us and bringing a friend. And uh, now I'd, I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Sims who will introduce our topic and our guest, Dr. Sims. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for why we invited Dr. McWade. Um, this particular talk was developed um, in collaboration with the Cultural Center and the Civic Fair Center, uh, the Center for Civic Engagement, excuse me, as well as the um, Global Local Health Initiative Speaker Series, which has been developed with the um, financial support of the um, National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, the pur purpose of our planning grant was to create a number of undergraduate cluster courses. Uh, these courses are concentrating on the connections um, between the healthcare disparities and needs within immigrant and predominantly refugee communities here on Long Island. Two of those courses are running this semester, uh, My History of Disease and Health, uh, as well as a course uh, taught by my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Craig Dalton and Kari Jensen, uh, Geography of Global Health. Next semester, if you're still looking for a course to sort of round out your schedule, is the third uh, course in the cluster. It is the uh, course taught by Drs. Anthony Santella and Isma Chaudhry. Uh, it is Immigrant and Refugee Health, uh, HPR 135, if you're looking for another course for the spring. So we're very, very happy uh, to collaborate um, on this day of dialogue with this very uh, timely discussion. So without further ado, I will introduce uh, Dr. McWade. Uh, please think about your questions, jot them down, put, a, put them in the chat, because the final um, portion of our time together will be devoted to a Q&A. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts, okay? Dr. Lena McWade is the department chair and professor of women's and gender studies at Sonoma State University. She is uniquely positioned to guide us through this really timely discussion because of her research interests in reproductive politics, gender and race and you in the US public health. Um, she explores uh, feminist interdisciplinary methodologies, US and Mexico border uh, studies, uh, as well as critical race and queer theory. She has published um, on the history of the Pateras, uh, which are Mexican, Nuevo Mexicana, as she describes them, midwives, uh, as well as health along the U.S.-Mexico border, and the history of Jewish feminism and the bar mitzvah. 
She's published Birth Control, which is part of it, and An Indispensable Service, two works I am intimately uh, familiar with as I've assigned them to my courses over the past years. So we are honored to have Dr. McWade as our inaugural speaker for the Global Local Health Initiative Speaker Series. Please let's welcome Dr. McWade. Hi folks, thank you so much. I would really just like to start by thanking Dr. Sims for reaching out to me. It's always wonderful as a scholar when you hear that other people are reading your research and teaching your research and interested in talking about it. So I really thank you so much for your interest. Um, and I thank you to the Day of Dialogue, the Center for Civic Engagement and all of the entities and people that have helped to put this day together. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm open to questions at any point in time on anything that we're talking about, as well as anything that you think might be related. So feel free to just put stuff in the chat and I look forward to talking with you at the end about any questions you might have. Let me just share a tiny bit about myself and how I came to this research project. Um, I earned my PhD in American Studies from the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I got a great piece of advice as a graduate student, which is to just try to grow or study wherever you're planted. So wherever you happen to be, wherever you find yourself, find something of interest there. So as a graduate student, I read a small footnote that said that New Mexico had the highest rate of infant mortality in the mid 20th century in the United States. And that footnote and the question about why New Mexico had the highest rate of infant mortality and what individuals and organizations and families did to address this health disparity has been my uh, driving question for the past 20 years. So that's part of what I'm going to be investigating with you all here today. Um, I feel very fortunate at an early stage in my graduate research that I also found the field, the developing activist and scholarly field of reproductive justice that I'll be talking about today that helps to frame my topic and my thinking. And the specific piece I want to talk about today is a birth control clinic, the history of the first freestanding um, birth control clinic that provided free birth control and free maternal and um, infant health resources in the very Catholic capital um, city in New Mexico, in Santa Fe. So I was very interested in how did a birth control clinic begin in the 1930s um, in New Mexico and how did it end up lasting until roughly the 19, um, 1990s. So that's what I'm looking at here today. I'd like to talk about birth control in New Mexico and what it meant to organize around infant mortality, what birth control means in that context, um, and then also bring that into our present moment. Uh, infant mortality was a major public health crisis that the United States was facing and specifically New Mexico was facing. And we're facing another public health crisis at the moment. And so an animating question for me is, what is the place of reproductive and sexual health during um, public health crises? So that's what I hope we can talk about here today to use this historical example to help us understand a little bit about the present and also to expand our understanding about history. So what I'd like to do to start is talk about some of the animating questions or the guiding questions in my research more broadly, as well as some of what we may get to touch on here today. So as I mentioned before, my a central question in my own research is why did New Mexico have the nation's highest rate of infant mortality? What were the factors that were contributing to this? And particularly what I'm interested in is the health disparity that becomes very apparent when you look at the statistics of infant mortality. It was clear that Latinx families in New Mexico faced infant mortality rates sometimes three times higher than the rates of white families. Counties that had predominantly um, Hispano or Mexican American Latinx um, communities or populations as well as indigenous Native American populations had much higher rates than the counties in New Mexico that bordered Texas that were predominantly white or Anglo is the term that's oftentimes used in New Mexico. So I was very interested in this racial health disparity. I wanted to know what caused infant mortality and not just what caused it, but also what more we could learn if we focused on the intersections of sexism, racism, colonialism, poverty, how all of these forms of oppression, discrimination, how all of these um, contributed to health disparities. 
And then I am interested in how New Mexican families, how healers, how organizations and health in institutions work to end infant mortality, right? As a feminist scholar, somebody in the field of women and gender studies, I'm always interested in activism. What are people doing at every level, just from trying to take care of your family, try to take care of the people around you, to forming major organizations and leading in public health? What are all the ways that people have tried to end health disparities? And then bringing us into the present moment, I'm really interested in how COVID-19 is impacting access to reproductive health services today. And I see a range of ways in which the current, um, the current pandemic is being used um, to frame or to deny or to encourage all different forms of reproductive health services. So just a couple to, to have in the backs of our minds that I'd love to talk more about is how the pandemic has shifted people's birth control practices. I have some statistics and some early research that's looking at how people's birth control practices today are, are being impacted by the pandemic. I'm also really interested in the ways that people's family building plans have been changed, right? Are people considering having kids right now? Are they postponing? Do they want to have more kids, less kids? How are people's thoughts about family formation changing? I'm also following how abortion has been defined in several states as non-essential medical care. And I think this term about what is considered essential, who is considered essential, these are some animating questions um, that we can negotiate and discuss and advocate around um, in this moment. It really reveals what we think is important as a nation, what gets deemed essential. And then also, right, looking even at the really contemporary news, right, how can we contextualize or think about some of the current allegations of forced sterilization or medical procedures that may have resulted in diminished reproductive capacity, and also just the general lack of healthcare options available to immigrant women, refugee women, women, migrant women that are currently being held in private for-profit U.S. detention facilities during COVID-19. So I won't be able to go quite as deeply into this, but I'd love to, um, to talk about some of these contemporary questions um, in our Q&A period. So these are some of the questions that are on my mind. What I'd like to talk about now is the framing concept for my own research and for the talk today. So I have been greatly influenced and just so grateful to reproductive justice organizers and theory, scholarship and activism in this field. Reproductive justice, the concept and the movement has emerged most prominently through Sister Song, which is a women of color reproductive Reproductive Healthcare Collective. They are the largest national multi-ethnic reproductive justice collective in the United States. I have an image here of some of um, the organizers um, in front of uh, their organization here. Sister Song has been instrumental in both doing grassroots reproductive justice work, working at policy levels, as well as in the realm of culture shift in creating concepts and shifting our perspectives about reproduction and questions particularly about justice. So I'd like to just define the concept of Sister Song defines it for us. Sister Song defines reproductive justice as a human right. So again, this is important. Human right goes beyond just rights within the United States, which we know, for those of us that study history, haven't equally applied to all people historically. So moving to a human rights framework moves even beyond some of the discrimination that has existed within US law to sort of try to get a more international perspective. So uh, Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy. It's also the human right to have children the right not to have children, and the right to parent children in safe and sustainable communities. What I would like to just mention here is that reproductive justice as a framework is different than a concept of reproductive choice as a framework. They're both important concepts, but choice focuses oftentimes more narrowly on access to abortion or access to birth control and protecting laws and policies that would allow people access to abortion and to birth control. The concept of justice is much broader. It asks questions about who has access, even if um, abortion is legal for 
for example, if you don't have the money to pay for one um, under the Hyde Amendment, right? Um, if you don't have the money to pay for one, if you live in a state that only has one abortion clinic in the whole state, or if you're working, you're dealing with childcare, right? There's so many ways in which even if something is legal, it may not be accessible. And that's the question really of justice. Who has access to what forms of um, reproductive options? Also, who has access to be able to have the children and to raise the children that they want to in health and safety? So I really appreciate the concept of reproductive justice because it helps me with this question of infant mortality, right? If, if your community isn't able to keep alive or your family isn't able to keep alive that the baby, keep alive the babies that you are having, right? That is a major reproductive injustice that might fall out of a choice framework that's just focused on abortion or on birth control. So this is why reproductive justice has been so helpful in my own research. Also, reproductive justice is critical because it, in achieving reproductive justice, it requires us to analyze and understand how power systems operate. And this is the piece that's the most interesting to me is really trying to take apart these intersecting power systems. So addressing intersecting oppressions is critical for reproductive justice. Asking these questions about how sexism, how racism, how classism, how these are interconnected and more importantly, how these forms of oppression differentially, right, in different ways, position people in relationship to social goods, position people differentially in access to healthcare, right? Not everybody has the same access to healthcare. And oftentimes oppressions around, um, around racism, around sexism, around homophobia, transphobia, classism, where these become major obstacles or barriers to accessing healthcare. So how people are differentially positioned, um, not only in relationship to social goods, to being able to get the things that you need, but also in exposure to harm. So in my own research, right, a lot of infant mortality is about why some families are more exposed to the harm of environmental racism, why some families are more exposed to the harms that come from not having access to clean water, from not having access to adequate sewage, from not having access to roads or to physicians. So reproductive justice as theorized by women of color through the Sister Song Collective has been a very helpful analytic frame in my own research. So what I'd like to shift to now is just talking a little bit about the place, context, and history of New Mexico. Um, for those of you that may or may not be familiar, I just want to give a snapshot just so we can understand a little bit of how context matters. I have two maps here showing the history of the land of New Mexico. What's important to understand in the first map, I have a yellow highlight uh, that I tried to draw here, um, showing the land that belonged to Mexico before the US-Mexico War, which culminated in 1848. And at the culmination of that war, you can see in the second image, all the land that then belongs to the United States by 1850. So essentially the entire US Southwest, um, Mexico was forced to cede one third of roughly one third of its land mass to the United States as a result of that war. And in that New Mexico became part of the United States. What I think is important in my own research is that from essentially 1848 until New Mexico became a state in 1912, New Mexico was a territory of the United States. It was not a state. And in a sense, New Mexico has a history that may be similar in territorial status to that of Puerto Rico, for example. So people in New Mexico became citizens of the United States, but they didn't have the types of rights that come from being in a state. So what's important here is that as a territory, um, many government officials were appointed by uh, the federal government to govern over the people of New Mexico. And this essentially is part of a colonial history where the vast majority of people in New Mexico were what we would today call Latinx, right? Were of Spanish, Mexican, and indigenous origin. The vast majority, right? European Americans were only like 2% of the population um, of the territory in 1850, but they were not able to govern themselves. So that's a colonial dynamic. And we can see that play right. out where New Mexico didn't have, um, wasn't able to apply for state grants that would allow it to build its health infrastructure. So in 1919, New Mexico becomes the last state in the nation to develop a public health department. So it struggled from the get go with getting the kinds of funding and um, infrastructure necessary to provide the health care needed for the population of New Mexico. My own 
research into this birth control clinic starts in the 1930s. So I just want to trace out the New Mexico population in the 1930s. And this is also what positions New Mexico um, differently from any other state in the United States. Even into the 1930s, Mexican Americans remained the population majority at 66% of the population. By this point in the 1930s, Native Americans are roughly 7% of the population. There are 23 sovereign nations within the state of New Mexico. There are 19 Pueblo nations, three Apache nations, and the Navajo nation. And also in the 19, by the 1930s, about 27% of the population is white. So New Mexico has been one of the few states that has been a people of color majority state um, in its history. And that those are different racial dynamics, right? People of color had more power, specifically Mexican Americans had more power in New Mexico because of their um, numerical um, dominance essentially than in Arizona or in Texas or in California where, um, where Euro-Americans or white people quickly outnumbered population-wise Mexican-Americans in the state. So just to highlight here, Mexican-Americans also in New Mexico uh, use many different racial terms, including Hispanos, Spanish-American, but I'll, I'll use the term Mexican-American most broadly here. Mexican-Americans in New Mexico held considerable social power in the 20th century as a population majority, as, um, as families that had land ownership for generations. Also, some of the um, earliest elected officials in New Mexico were Mexican Americans. Once uh, Mexican Americans could vote, they voted for some Mexican Americans as governor, which is unique in New Mexico. Also, New Mexico is one of the only states, I think it's the only state um, that has two languages that are both recognized as official languages, English as well as Spanish. That said, uh, Mexican Americans and indigenous folks in New Mexico certainly face complex forms of discrimination. These included colonialism, white supremacy, linguistic, economic, and cultural oppression. So as a scholar of the intersections of gender and race, I'm also particularly interested in how histories of colonialism mapped along lines, not only of race, but also along lines of gender. So I just want to highlight one of the racially and sexually and actually reproductively derogatory terms that I see appear again and again. And I want to use it as a way to also think about some of the derogatory language that we see in our contemporary moment. During the US-Mexico War, US Secretary of State James Buchanan, who went on to become the 15th president of the United States, said, how should we, meaning the United States, govern the mongrel race which, inhabit it, which inhabits it, meaning the northern part of Mexico that was going to become the US Southwest. And in using that term mongrel that I'm particularly interested in understanding its meanings, um, he was referring to the Spanish, Mexican, and, and indigenous people living in this territory. And this term mongrel reappears in the literature about New Mexico Mexico over and over. Here's the cover of a magazine from 1916. And what we see is essentially a mongrel dog. The text says, quote, all the way from Arizona. And at this point in time, Arizona and New Mexico were both petitioning for statehood. Um, at times, they were going to become one massive state, uh, but then they became two separate states, which is another history that I won't go into. But essentially, here is an image, right, of a mongrel dog. Um, the, the dog is depicted as Arizona dragging this can or something behind it that's called a piece of trash, right, essentially behind it um, that's labeled New Mexico. So, right, this is the territories of New Mexico and Arizona depicted as this mongrel dog in front of the doors of Congress, depicting Congress for for statehood or for full national inclusion. So I am very interested in what the term mongrel implies. It's doing specific kinds of cultural work. It's very derogatory, it's very denigrating, but it's denigrating and derogatory in specific ways. And in my own research, it's been important to pull, pull out and understand this complexity. I think in some ways it echoes in some ways, right, um, the president's very derogatory um, references to people of Mexican origin or Central American origin as quote unquote rapists, right? There's a way in which mongrel or rapists are people beyond, or they're not, not people, right? It's about being not human, it's being a monster, it's about being animal, it's about being outside of the category of human, and not just outside, but like outside in a terrible way. So some of what the term mongrel implies, if you just look it up on Wikipedia, 
Wikipedia, right, it means literally a mixed breed dog, a dog that doesn't have a formal type of pedigree. So when I hear that word and that's what I think of, I think about this term breeding and I think about how that has reproductive ramifications, sexual ramifications. I always teach my students that anytime humans are referred to as animals um, or, or uh, animals other than humans, right, we're definitely in the realm oftentimes of racist depictions. So it's, it's very much about dehumanizing people. I also think that this term mongrel or speaking about New Mexico as a mongrel is a way of talking about a type of fantasy, and this is a white supremacist um, heteropatriarchal fantasy of a type of unregulated reproduction that's imagined to be happening um, by and on and in the bodies predominantly of women of color in New Mexico. <clears throat> Mexican, um, Mex Spanish Mexican origin women, indigenous women, and that this sexuality and this reproduction needs to be controlled. It's out of line. This fantasy, the flip side to that fantasy is also a fantasy of whiteness as somehow pure, right? At the same time that these discourses about New Mexico being a quote unquote mongrel for being mixed in its racial origins, right? We see all kinds of mixing among white ethnics happening in the United States, but somehow that is not described as a mongrelization in the same ways that people of color are envisioned um, to have this very derogatory association. So uh, the flip side of the fantasy of um, mongrel is this notion of white as racially pure and something to be protected. Um, the, the reproductive capacities are be, to be protected, white women are to be protected, that their motherhood is somehow ideal, juxtaposed against this um, seen as problematic motherhood or reproduction of women of color in New Mexico. So in this context, right, this is some of the context um, in which we can look at infant mortality in New Mexico. So this is just a big graph, but essentially what I'm trying to show here is that um, looking in the 1930s, if you're able to see my cursor, the infant mortality rate and the infant mortality rate measures how many babies per 1,000 die within their first year of life. And sometimes I just have to take a breath when I share that, right? My research, um, this is a really heavy topic. People that I know and love have lost babies, right? Many of us may have experienced, um, you know, these forms of hardship in our own families or in our own history. So I always, like, I want to take a breath um, and just sort of acknowledge both the fact that this needs to be studied, but that this is also, right, histories that are carried for people. So that said, um, the infant mortality rate in um, the United States in the 1930s was around 64 infants per 1,000, whereas in New Mexico, we can see it's over double at 145. And this infant mortality rate in New Mexico, New Mexico um, remains the state with the highest infant mortality rate throughout the 1950s. It doesn't really begin to change um, until the 1960s and into the 1970s. So some of the reasons for this high rate of infant mortality, as I mentioned earlier, it's clear that there's a racial disparity in infant mortality and we can just zoom in on, um, on Santa Fe where the birth control clinic that I studied is located. We can see that in 1937, when this birth control clinic gets established, Spanish Americans or Latinx folks make up 81% of the county population, but have an infant mortality rate of 166. So this is higher than the state um, total and it's certainly higher than the national infant mortality rate right by over threefold of 54 at the time. So it is certainly Latinx and indigenous families that are experiencing the highest rates of infant mortality. The causes of infant mortality in the second graph we can see unknown causes are the number one um, reported reason which means that no physician was present when these infants died. It means that these babies died without ever being treated or without a physician who was able to diagnose what was happening. Right. So again when I see statistics like this I'm immediately thinking about forms of injustice right of uh, families that are unable to access doctors, don't feel safe to access doctors, don't have the money, don't have the linguistic resources to access doctors. We can see that the next um, major cause is digestive diseases. And indeed, right, the major causes of infant mortality for infants was from drinking untreated water. 
Um, so this is definitely about forms of environmental injustice and environmental racism that are happening in New Mexico, families that are unable to get clean water um, for, for their families. And then we can also see just two images of some of the inadequate infrastructure in New Mexico. The top image is an ambulance that's trying to get to somebody, but it's stuck in the mud and the nurse and a translator are having to get out to walk the rest of the way. The next image we see is two different families going by a horse drawn wagon um, to go to another health facility in Taos, right? So a lack of formal medical care, um, inadequate infrastructure. New Mexico is also one of the poorest states in the nation. And I would argue that all of this is intertwined with legacies of colonialism and racism in the state. So these are some of the reasons my research explores all the different kinds of responses to infant mortality. So some of the other research that I do is on midwifery, parteria, um, or the ways that Spanish speaking women have for generations trained um, in lay midwifery practices to take care of infants and women um, during birth as well as in the afterbirth process. So that's another piece of my research. What I wanna talk about today though is a birth control clinic that was created. It was started in 1937 and it continued until 1996. So as a historian, I'm very interested in how a birth control clinic, first of all, got started in New Mexico in 1937 and how it managed to survive for so, uh, for so many decades. So I just wanna say at the outset that the Santa Fe Maternal Health Center was originally um, organized by four or five white women, um, only one of whom was from New Mexico. The others were transplants into the state of New Mexico. They were very involved in the arts scene that was happening in Santa Fe and they were also very involved in philanthropy. Essentially, they, um, they had the type of economic resources where they didn't have to work for wages outside of the home and they could sort of dedicate themselves to artistic and philanthropic endeavors. That was very different than the population that they were treating, that they ended up treating or working with at the clinic, who were predominantly Spanish speaking um, Latinas or Nueva, uh, Nuevo Mexicanas, um, who were also predominantly Catholic, many of whom were working poor. So when the Santa Fe Maternal Health Center founders, um, they heard a public health talk about infant mortality in the state and they reportedly were shocked into action. Um, and they initially imagined that they could create a birth control clinic and that through offering free birth control, they might be able to help lower the infant mortality rate. And they joined a birth control movement that was really underway in the late 1930s once um, the one stock rule, um, the, uh, the <laughs> let me get my mind here. Um, once the, um, the, Com the Comstock law, um, the one package um, um, Supreme Court case ruled that you could disseminate contraceptives and information about contraceptives via the mail. So once that was passed, once it became legal to talk about contraceptives, all kinds of birth control clinics begin. And this is actually Margaret Sanger's history. Some of you may know Margaret Sanger. So she was very involved in sponsoring these birth control clinics throughout the nation. There were over 500 of them. Um, so the Santa Fe Maternal Health Center joined, but very quickly, the history in Santa Fe diverted from the other free birth control clinics in the nation, which primarily just focused on sort of the single focus on choice or just on birth control. The Santa Fe Clinic, very few women actually came to, San, to the clinic for birth control. So if they were only going to offer birth control, they didn't have a successful business model. Not enough people were coming um, to, to justify the clinic staying open. So the clinic organizers quickly expanded their scope and moved into what I call a much more comprehensive reproductive health care model, where they always offered the option of birth control. But in order to stay open and alive, they discovered that they had to just offer a much wider range of health care resources because that is what um, predominantly the Latina patients who came into the clinic wanted. They wanted health services for their babies, for their children, for their families, and for themselves. And sometimes they also did want birth control, but it was always in addition to broader health services, and it wasn't always for birth control. Again, because infant mortality was so great, many families were really just focused on keeping their children alive. So I just want to toss out a couple of the conflicting forces um, that were up against this clinic and then move us into the present day. So when I studied this clinic, uh, the clinic, you know, it, it tried to exist in this predominantly heavily Catholic um, city 
and they didn't really receive support from doctors. They didn't receive support from the public health department or from the Catholic church. They also eventually within a year didn't receive any more support from Margaret Sanger's organization. They were really up against um, a number of opposing forces and had to carefully find their path forward. So the Catholic church was very publicly opposed to birth control. It was also po very politically powerful. But I also discovered in my own research that there was a lot of complexity in interpretations of Catholic rules about birth control and that many Latinx families made their own decisions about birth control and its role in their family. They made their decisions independently or as couples or in consultation with family members, community members, and sometimes even in consultation with clergy members. Um, Margaret Sanger's organization, the Clinical Research Bureau, gave the initial funding to support the birth control clinic. But when they, when the clinic applied to renew their grant, Margaret Sanger's um, organization denied their request on the grounds that too much general medical care was being offered and not enough birth control work was being done to justify their continuing funding. Margaret Sanger's organization was just laser focused on birth control and that was all that they wanted clinics to do. And on the flip side, the state public health department also said they would fund the clinic, but only if it did its medical and social work and stopped doing birth control work and publicly opposed birth control. So the clinic essentially said, we don't want any of these options. So their way forward to navigate a careful path was to publicly highlight their maternal and infant services. They talked about that all the time while quietly continuing to offer birth control to women who requested it. And that became the most successful successful model for the clinic for decades going forward. They also had to turn to private fundraising and extensive volunteer work to maintain their clinic all the way, you know, almost until the 80s. Some of the founders of the clinic gave up to 40 years of volunteer service. Um, all of the four founders gave between 25 to 40 years of service to this clinic. Um, so right, deep commitment to this clinic and what it was doing. Interestingly, the Santa Fe Maternal Health Center never affiliated with Planned Parenthood. They were asked several times to affiliate and they decided um, that they had their own unique model, perhaps because of their history of being denied. They never did affiliate with Planned Parenthood. And the positives of that was that they were able to continue in their unique model of comprehensive reproductive health services. But the drawback is that in um, the 1970s, as healthcare became more expensive, they didn't have a larger infrastructure um, like Planned Parenthood to help them transition into the modern medical economy and essentially they had to close the clinic because they could no longer continue to offer the free services that they had been serving. Um, over the span of the Maternal Health Center's six decades of service, they served over 20,000 people, which is a large number for New Mexico, the state of New Mexico. I mean, the um, the city of Santa Fe only has like 40, only have 40,000 people in it. So essentially, right, they just served so many people in the community. And we can see that the infant mortality rate did drop from 120 in 1937 to 14 in 1979. And while the clinic cannot be credited um, solely with, um, with that drop rate, they, they may have been an important piece of that. So what I'd like to turn to just before we open it up for any kinds of questions is just some of the current conflicting pressures around COVID-19 and sexual and reproductive health care. I want to just share um, a little bit of the research that has been published by the Guttmacher Institute. They conducted a national survey here in May just a couple months ago on the impact of the emerging pandemic on women's sexual and reproductive health. And I just want to pull a couple highlights from that. What they noted is that um, more than 40% of women reported that because of the pandemic, they have changed their plans about when to have children or how many to have. And what they also have noted is that women already experiencing systemic health and social inequities reported the greatest changes. So black women at 44% and Hispanic women at 48% were more likely than white women at 28% to state that because of the pandemic, they wanted to have fewer children or have children later. And again, from a reproductive justice framework, where we're focusing not only on access to um, abortion and birth control, which are critical, but 
also on the ability to have the children that you would want to have and to be able to parent the children in health and safety that you do have, right? This is, these are signs of major um, reproductive injustices that we see as an outcome of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. Additionally, one in three women reported that because of the pandemic, they had trouble getting their birth control or had to cancel or delay visiting a healthcare provider for sexual or reproductive health. These barriers to timely care were more common among Black women at 38% and Hispanic women at 45% than among white women at 29%. So again, seeing these racial disparities in access to care. And then they also have a couple graphics that are helpful for us to kind of grab on to this information. The first is from figure two. It's one third of women report having experienced pandemic related delays or cancellations of contraceptives or other sexual or reproductive health care. And again, we can see the discrepancies here along the lines of race and also along the lines of sexual or orientation, right? Queer women were experiencing 46% uh, 46, 46 of um, queer women were reporting delays or cancellations in contraceptive services in comparison to heterosexual women. In figure three, we also see that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, many women worry more than previously about being able to afford and get sexual and reproductive health care. And I think, again, right, even just tracking worry is an important piece of understanding how people are being impacted along the lines of gender, race, and economic marginalization. And again, here we see women of color reporting that they are experiencing higher levels of worry and concern about being able to access reproductive and sexual health care. And then just in our final slide here, we see that many women report that their fertility preferences have shifted in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the number of women reporting they want to delay childbearing or again have few fewer children. And again, we can see a racial disparity here appearing um, in who is thinking that having children is even a possibility for them. A final thing I'd like to note is that attitudes towards contraceptives have also shifted during this time. One third of women agreed with the statement that because of, COVID because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I am more careful than I used to be about using contraception every time I have sex. So one third of women are agreeing with this statement. So this is definitely an increase in use of birth control or reported use. And again, we see that black women at 44% and Hispanic women at 43% intend to use contraceptives more consistently. Um, and they are reporting this more so than white women at 30%. So what we see here, contrary to some of the stereotypes, is that women of color are, are reporting that they are, um, that they intend to use contraception um, consistently. And they're reporting that at higher rates than white women. So just to conclude here, I just want to pull three final quotes or statements from scholars and activists that are writing about COVID-19 and its impact on um, reproductive health access. The first, um, and I should, I'll just say also that um, I sent a little PDF that has some of my sources here and hopefully that can get sent around to folks. Um, there's lots of great reporting, podcasts, organizations to follow, short articles to read that are all really documenting both the racial disparities in COVID, but also the ways in which these are intersectional, right? The ways in which sexism and racism, as well as economic poverty are combining to differentially position people's access in these moments. So so intersecting injustices mean that those whose human rights are least protected, right, women, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, poor people, are particularly hard hit during this current pandemic. Quote, they're left to reconcile the often incompatible demands of precarious jobs, potential ex exposure to COVID-19, and the stress of caring responsibilities under lockdown. And another scholar activist is writing that a sexual and reproductive health and justice policy agenda must be at the heart of the COVID-19 response. 
The response must ensure that universal health coverage includes pregnant women, it includes adolescents, it includes marginalized groups, and must designate sexual and reproductive health, family planning, and community health centers as essential health providers. Again, here's this word essential, right? That it's that health, um, that sexual and reproductive health is not something that's marginal or sidelined, that it's actually central to our coronavirus response and that we have to reallocate resources accordingly. Policy makers potentially could scale up telemedicine. There's some conflicting reports about this, but some folks are definitely advocating for more tele, um, telemedicine for needed evidence-based care for women and girls, including sexual and reproductive health care. And finally, right, what we label essential during an international health crisis reveals and it also perpetuates what we value and we support as a society, as a global community, and I would like to leave with the argument that reproductive justice is essential. Thank you so much for your time. I'm so happy to answer any questions or comments that emerge. If people want um, access, I do have some of the PDFs of my research up on academia. So that's kind of a way if you don't have um, access to the resources to be able to find them for free. Okay, we have our first question from Graziella. Graziella, would you like to unmute yourself and read your question? She may not be able to. Unmute okay, her. that's no problem, Graziella. Okay, so Graziella has a question for you, Dr. McWade. Were the reasons for the lack of Mexicans reaching out for medical and economic assistance, what were, excuse me, what were the reasons for the lack of Mexicans reaching out for medical and economic assistance? And then she wants to know, was it um, sexism or racism? Yeah, this is such a great question. Um, what I, to answer it is both, right? It was both sexism and racism. Okay. So I guess what I can say is, um, well, just to say it plainly, right? This, this particular health clinic, as well as the public health department, English was the dominant language that was spoken. So it was both like an English dominant language space and also an Anglo or white dominant space. So even though they were very, both of these institutions were interested in reaching out to indigenous and Mexican American populations, right, these were English dominated spaces and definitely had white cultural norms. Plus for many Catholic women, the bishops or um, the priests in New Mexico were very clear that even just uh, walking through the threshold or even attempting to attend at this clinic was an abomination, right? Or was something mm. that would go against their religion. So to show up in a space um, that your religious community had, um, had uh, publicly opposed in a space where you know people may not speak your language, right? It took great courage to seek out I would argue these kinds of reproductive health care, um, any kind of health care that was available or these types of medical research uh, resources. So I, I think that was that was a large part of it. And I think there's a combination of both racism and sexism at play. Um, and there's also a way in which traditionally um, women, uh, Nuevo Mexicana women had worked within their own communities, within their own families or with traditional health practitioners like curanderas or parteras to meet their healthcare needs. So to go out into sort of a more quote unquote white or Western model of public health, right, meant going beyond sort of a, a cultural frame. So I think that, I think, and some of that, sometimes women were more responsible or seen as more responsible to maintain cultural norms. So I think there may have also been forms of sexism at play there also. I guess what I can say is I felt like the women who did attend the clinic were, from my read of it, were incredibly brave and incredibly brave and incredibly driven as mothers to take care of their families at, at whatever cost um, to try to get any kind of resources available, even if they knew they may not be fully understood, um, they were willing to take that risk. Thank you. Uh, Hannah has a question. Uh, what is your opinion on how some catastrophic events can cause a baby boom? While others, like our current um, situation with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we are seeing a deep decrease in people wanting to have children. So Hannah just wants to know your general opinion of why this happens. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is such a great question. People have done research um, on the Great Recession, also on Hurricane Katrina, right, and how these major um, events, downturns in the economy, 
or um, um, major environmental catastrophes have uh, have in in both of these cases right reduced in the initial in the initial phase reduced. Um, reduce population trends. So we may, we're definitely seeing that um, if fewer people are getting pregnant currently, but again, we may see a boom happen after a vaccine becomes available or um, in the next couple of years in response to this. I think at first when people went into lockdown, there were questions about whether or not everybody at home together all the time might result in an uptick um, in, um, in pregnancies. But the research so far is showing um, that it doesn't look like um, that that has been the case in part, right? I think it's because as we've seen just in some of these early charts, right? The worry about economics and the ability to mm -hmm. afford and take care of children as well as the necessity to have to go to a doctor if you're pregnant or to give birth during this time, right? These are high, these are strong concerns for people um, that I think are also reducing at the moment um, the, uh, the pregnancy rates, but uh, I'm, something that's unfolding right before our very eyes. So I'm curious to see also um, what unfolds. Yes. Isabella has a question that I think all of us are thinking about is sort of on all of our minds in some way with the recent appointment of Amy Coney uh, Barrett to the Supreme Court. So here's Isabella's question. With the new 6-3 conservative majority in the Supreme Court, there is increased fear that access to reproductive health will decrease as a result. How do you think this will impact the future of reproductive justice? Yeah, this is this is a great question. These are trying mm -hmm. times. Um, and I would argue that to a certain degree, times have gotten, <laughs> maybe there's an argument that times are getting harder. But I would say that, you know, with the passage of the Hyde Amendment that essentially has blocked any kind of federal funding for abortion care, it has meant that unless you can afford upfront, right, the cash for abortion, if you don't, if it's not covered by your insurance, many women have not had access to abortion now um, for decades if they cannot afford the procedure and afford to take the time off of work and to be able to access the site. So in a sense, right, and the women who are, have been blocked from accessing abortion as they may want to, right, are predominantly working poor women. Um, so I think that, I think that there are ways in which communities have already been trying to organize against the Hyde Amendment and restrictive um, uh, policies that are attempting to restrict abortion access and particularly restrict it right to those who most need it um, or who, who would most need access. So I think that we can really draw from activists that have already been working to deal with um, reproductive um, healthcare obstacles. And I, I encourage those of you that are scholarly minded to read some of the histories that have been written. Um, there is some great work on um, before abortion in the time period before abortion became legal, right? How communities and individuals and families and organizations organized around particularly abortion in the period before it became legal, before 1973. There's also a really powerful oral history that was done um, called the Jane Collective um, that yeah. was a radical group of women in the 1970s who didn't have access, abortion was still illegal. And they essentially learned how to do abortions themselves and began the lay practice of abortion. And some even argue that uh, part of the Roe v. Wade decision was an attempt to um, make sure that doctors would be the only ones performing abortions and that there weren't more lay practices happening around abortion. But I think that's a really important history. I think it's important also to look transnationally. Um, there are organizations like Women on the Waves, right, that have sort of created these um, ship-based <laughs> um, uh, medicine or abortion abortions that can happen on a ship so that people are able to come off of their country and onto the ship in international waters to be able to have these procedures. So I think that uh, so as a historian of this, I am heartened <laughs> by, I'm heartened and terrified. Um, I'm heartened by the fact that no matter what the obstacles have been, women and families have always sought out the reproductive health care that they think that they need, regardless of laws, regardless of um, money, right? People have have sought out 
the, the reproductive health care that they believed that they needed. So I'm heartened by the strength of organizing. And I am terrified. Also, many people died because they didn't have access to physician um, assisted abortion. Um, right, some of the first women to die after the Hyde Amendment passed were women of color who could not access um, a safe medical abortion, safe and legal medical abortion. Um, so as a historian, I try to dig into the history and as somebody in activist realms, I try to draw strength from activists that have already been working on the ways in which reproductive health care access has been foreclosed um, or limited, very limited for many people. Um, so that's that's sort of what I can what I can say. I, I mean, the one other thing I would say, just looking at um, right, the Affordable Care Act also, that once once people get a right, it is very hard to take that right back. Um, it's not impossible, it certainly has happened, um, but it is hard once people have a sense of being legally entitled to something to then to remove that. So, um, yeah, but I, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can maybe at the moment. If anybody else wants to weigh in about this, I mean, this is sort of. <laughs> That was excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Santella, my colleague, would like to say thank you for the very thoughtful and organized presentation. Uh, he says that it clearly shows us the importance of the past as we try to improve and right size public health in the United States. Uh, for another question, we have Nico. Uh, who would like uh, to sort of get your perspective on the ways that um, religious institutions have politicized health care. Uh, so here's Nico's question. What, if any change, have you noticed regarding religious convictions and their current impact on minorities' efforts to seek out reproductive care? Yeah, this is a great question. <laughs> that I, I mean, something I was surprised to find in my own research into the history of the Santa Fe Maternal Health Center was at the first level when I started to research, it was very clear the Catholic Church, it was very vocal in its opposition. It printed its sermon in the newspaper that was, it's Christmas Eve, the sermon that was all against the Maternal Health Center and birth control is this ultimate sin in our city of holy faith of Santa Fe. So that's what I thought that the Catholic Church's perspective would be. But then as I was looking through um, some of the business ledgers of the organization, they, they had all these different um, ways to try to fund their organization, including creating a thrift store. Um, and the Catholic Church also participated in that thrift store. And there was a Catholic maternity institute in Santa Fe. And patients went back and forth between the Catholic Maternity Institute and the Santa Fe Maternal Health Center. So while there isn't, you know, some sort of secret, you know, um, support from a document that really um, documents the Catholic Church's support, I think at one level they were very publicly opposed, but privately um, the records indicate that there really even was some cooperation quietly between the maternal health center and the Catholic church. And I think in part to get to your question, right, about minority health care access, I think that the Catholic church, this is just me speculating here, but my, my thinking is that the Catholic church in New Mexico was smart and it realized that some of its parishioners were going to the Santa Fe maternal health center. And I think that there may have been a way in which in attempting to keep them as parishioners, they, after their initial <clears throat> real denigration of the healthcare center um, or the healthcare clinic, they weren't, they weren't as vocally publicly opposed through the duration. And I think it was, I think the Catholic church was smart. And I think that the birth control clinic was smart in that the clinic didn't talk about birth control ever um, publicly and the Catholic church kind of stopped publicly opposing it. So I think that there was sort of like a cold war piece that happened where there was a recognition, especially in Santa Fe when there, you know, it would, I mean, people were dying because they didn't have access to food because their children, the children couldn't go to school because they didn't have shoes people didn't have jackets right children would like share jackets one day you could go to school because you had the jacket the next day your sister went to school because she wore the jacket right that these were incredibly um, resource strapped times for many folks in New Mexico and any kind of available resources I, I think that I think that all entities were in support of that I think that so what I and, and also I mean I did read 
one woman in an oral history said that initially when she talked to a member of the Catholic leadership, they told her absolutely no birth control. And then a new priest came and he said, you can make your own decisions about the kind of family that you want to have, which she interpreted to mean that she could have been using birth control. So I think that even among um, some of the Catholic officials themselves, there, there was a range of messaging around birth control. And I don't know, I haven't studied it as much in the present moment, but I would be very curious. I think that there, I'd be very curious to see if there's sort of a public statement, which is very clear about the Catholic, Catholic Church's perspective on birth control, but I'd be interested to see the ways in which um, specifically Catholics, right, also come to hold their faith and come to believe the birth control in certain ways or at certain times um, or all the time is a practice that their family um, is going to engage in. So I, I hope I'm answering your question. Please come back. You and are. That's, that's great. Okay. <laughs> Anna would like to thank you for your time and for sharing your research. And she's marveling at how you were able to condense your uh, research down to half an hour. Uh, she's bringing or oh, redirecting our attention to your examination of the word mongrel uh, and its implications in the way that it's used to describe indigenous and Mexican people. Uh, she also reflected on the way you uh, talked about the word um, and its implication that white motherhood is more desirable. Uh, so here's the question. Uh, she's wondering um, if you think that this sentiment is being reproduced today and whether um, and whether it be in mainstream media or in sort of biased practices in the medical field, and how does access to birth control reflect these sentiments today? Um, so she's uh, hoping that we can extrapolate <laughs> um, and, and sort of con make that conversation contemporary. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, I think it, it is there, no question, right? Even in these Supreme Court confirmation hearings where we saw how, um, right, where we saw how the motherhood practices of Amy were really highlighted. And in fact, I think, you know, one of the senators says she changed her view because of what a great mother um, this new Supreme Court justice is or appeared to be. So, right, there's a way in which her having a large family, um, and there's also, right, I, I wish I could, uh, maybe I can send it, maybe it was in Politico, there was a great article that was written by another, I think it was an adjunct teaching at Notre Dame and talking about how, or no, I think she was an assistant professor, how Notre Dame did not have a maternal, uh, didn't have a family leave policy. Um, or, or its family leave policy. So even though it's like this Catholic institution that's all about pro-life, uh, uh, pro pro-family, um, it doesn't have, a, it doesn't have a, a parental leave policy that was robust enough for her. She wanted, she was a Catholic, right? Devout Catholic woman who wanted to have more than one child. And because she also wanted her career as a professor, she was only able to have one child. And um, and so I think some of, and some of the critique was is that she wasn't earning enough money um, to be able to hire the outside help that Amy has been able to hire. Um, and also I think her family made something like 10 times the median income in the community where she was living. So when you have access, when you're white, and when you have access to lots of money, when you have access to outside help, oftentimes to buy the labor of poor women of color, right? Somehow whiteness or somehow then you your motherhood is lauded. And this is not mm -hmm. the way in which women of color that have that have larger family sizes than two children, right? They're not seen in that same type of way. So I would say absolutely the way that white mothers are seen as more desirable is absolutely played out in these confirmation. I mean, it's part of what played out in these confirmation hearings. Um, you know, the other piece also, uh, this is a lot to bring in, right? But looking at the allegations of sterilization or the possible removal of ovaries, right? Which would reduce reproductive capacity or removal of one ovary, the possible, um, uh, rep which would definitely um, decrease reproductive capacity that is alleged to have been perpetuated on or, or happened to um, women 
currently being held in um, for-profit detention centers um, over, overseen by ICE but contracted out um, to for private detention centers that then contract out to their health care, right, that there's absolutely ways in which um, refugee um, folks or people coming to seek asylum in the United States, which is legal to do, which is protected by um, not only U.S. law and international law, but it's sort of like one of the ethos of the United States, <laughs> right, that we, we are a country of immigrants. Right, but to see the way in which immigrant women um, are being treated in this contemporary moment, particularly their reproductive health, right, is absolutely right. The flip side of this fantasy, this assumption that these are absolutely illegitimate reproducers are problematic, and that their reproduction needs to be is, uh, needs to be controlled, and possibly even allegedly to the points of sterilization. And again, with the current allegations that are happening, some of the allegations, in addition, are not only about sterilization, but also the destruction of medical records. Um, and not only that, but also that. Uh, both the detainees as well as the staff are not being protected against um, COVID-19. So a whole range of potential injustices that are happening in detention centers, specifically around healthcare and reproductive healthcare, in addition to the larger context of injustice that's happening. Um, and I think that really points again to who, who is seen as a valued and important mother or not even current mother, but potential future mother and who is seen as an absolutely problematic potential reproducer, reproducer or future mother. Um, and while, because if there has been destruction of records, that still is something that's been alleged, we may never be able to know exactly the depth of what has been happening, but some of what I have sent in the PDF um, talks also about the history of sterilization. There certainly is a history of Mexican American women in California, as well as more broadly experiencing forms of sterilization. Puerto Rico has a long history of being a test site for the birth control pill. New Mexico itself, um, the Santa Fe Maternal Health Center was also a test site for birth control a foam powder method. So again, I think that all this history as well as the present moment indicates that some women are really seen, um, are, are absolutely seen as ideal mothers. And oftentimes that is about supporting white supremacy or supporting white women. Um, and other women are seen as problematic mothers, predominantly women of color. And of course I'm thinking, uh, I, I'm trying to remember her name um, on the conversation around the elevation of white woman, white motherhood. Motherhood in Black and White with Felstein. Um, excellent book that sort of explores that further if you want um, a historical context. Nicholas has a question. With the clear need for reproductive justice within our society and an even greater need for it in areas of disp disproportionate wealth, uh, do you think the fight for reproductive justice is also a fight to prevent further criminality uh, in neighborhoods that can't necessarily afford um, or like you've said previously, have access to proper medical care? Yeah, I mean, I think that this question of criminality is absolutely central in reproductive justice. And I would argue that Sister Song, the Women of Color Reproductive um, Collective and organizers and thinkers within, activists and thinkers within that organization have been at the forefront of talking about police brutality um, or police and state violence as forms of reproductive injustice, right? Um, when Trayvon Martin was killed, a reproductive justice activists were at the forefront of saying, right, this is somebody's son. This is somebody's son who did not get, this is a, you know, this is a family who did not get to raise their child in health and safety. They were denied that opportunity because of racism and white supremacy. So um, reproductive justice advocates have been at the forefront of thinking about how these forms of criminalization, how these forms of state violence also need to be thought about within a reproductive context, the ways in which criminality, um, criminal assumptions about people are ways of curtailing their family formation. Um, and so I hope I'm I hope I'm answering that there, but absolutely, I would say reproductive justice advocates have been at the forefront of really arguing. One of the um, pieces that I have in that little PDF of sources is a um, is a podcast series by Kimberly Crenshaw. 
who is oftentimes um, credited with um, coining the term intersectionality, although she, she recognizes it has a long history um, as a concept, right? But as a legal scholar, she needed a term to be able to describe the intersecting forms of racism and sexism that she was trying to adjudicate as a lawyer or bring justice to her, primarily her black female clients who were experiencing um, both forms of racial injustice and sexism at the same time. Uh, and in specific ways that were different than black men and white women. So she she has a, a podcast series called Under the Black Light that has, um, has some great podcasts that are talking specifically about COVID-19, about um, healthcare injustice. And also she does a lot of work with families um, who have lost loved ones to state violence or to police violence and particularly um, families that have lost um, women or femme members of their families to state violence. So she's a great resource to also um, check in with. She has, I think it's on YouTube or you can find it on her website, the African American Policy, um, uh, I think it's Institute or Federation, sorry, I can't remember the exact, um, the exact acronym at this moment. Uh, Rosario has a question. Go ahead, Rosario. Hi, okay, so mine is kind of long. Uh, the way in which people frame self-maintained abortions, SMA, as a bad thing in context of the pro-choice movement's prioritization of the Roe versus Wade decision, despite the fact it's already been mentioned both here and like in the communities, um, it's already been highlighted that the Hyde Amendment has already been blocking access to safe and legal abortions for literally anyone who just can't afford that or can't prioritize that type of money, um, which has led to a different movement label being used as pro-abortion versus pro-choice. Like I personally am pro-abortion um, as are many of my friends. Um, in terms of bodily autonomy and agency, do you feel as though this branch movement or like new label essentially a new like kind of take on reproductive justice or this specific aspect of reproductive justice um, does a better job of encompassing bodily autonomy in terms of race, gender, sexuality, um, versus the history that surrounds the pro-choice movement prioritizing cisgender, heterosexual white women's ability to choose. Yeah. So you're talking about the movement to a specific label of pro-abortion rather than just pro-choice. Am I getting the language there correct? Yeah, it's like um, my friend Joe uh, posted this like a uh, really long thread just about like self-maintained abortions and was like the reason that I as a black trans person have chosen to use the label as pro-abortion versus pro-choice is because the pro-choice movement historically has, as I said, like prioritized white cisgender heterosexual women. And in addition to, it doesn't acknowledge the fact that this isn't just about choice. It's about, I'm trying to get access to a very specific medical and or cultural uh, thing that I need. And I don't care about these other things such as like when white women talk about agency, they're just like, oh, I would like to choose to not have children. Whereas black and brown women are like, I would like to not be forcibly sterilized. I would like to live in a place that's not like a, like the target of eco racism, um, ecological racism, such as like Flint, Michigan. Um, and I would like to be able to raise my children where I'm not seeing them shot in the street every other week right. um, versus like this idea that like, oh, I just wanna like be able to do these things. Whereas like, it's a different conversation for both. So where people are talking about pro-abortion, they're like, I need to get access to this one specific thing and we need to stop calling it such small things as if to diminish what it is. It's abortion, it's not a bad thing, it's a medical procedure. This is a great question. Um, my, first, my first thought on this is that I think the move like this move is the important piece. Like um, I know that labels become important or a specific set of terminology. Um, I don't know if the language pro-abortion is like the ticket, <laughs> but the move behind it, I think is the ticket, <laughs> right? Or is, is what is important, right? And the move behind it to try to, um, to try to center the specific needs of those who are being most impacted, I think is a key move. I think that is also what the, my understanding of what reproductive justice does is that it moves the center. It moves the center away from those who maybe have the most forms of social privilege and are just, are now trying to access some additional forms of choice and moving the frame to say, who actually has the least access and how can we center those lives and experiences right, um, trans people of color, for example, right, as definitely not within the center. So how could we, what happens when we put 
trans folks of color at the center of our thinking about reproductive justice. So I think that move is critical. Um, and then the types of language that people come up with to self-designate that move, I think is also always important. I think, I think there's a way in which this sort of pro-choice, pro-life, without actually mentioning the word abortion, right? It's, it has, it's, it's been sort of a political, um, there, it's a political strategy, but I think that there are ways in which talking specifically about the thing <laughs> is a critical move. I think that, I think speaking about specifically what it is, if that is abortion, or even think about like Me Too, right, to like actually detail what forms of sexual violence look like in the workplace, and to actually come out and say what it is. What I have noticed in the scholarship and sort of the activist scholarship is a lot more writing about people's stories of abortion. Um, there's the Abortion Diary podcast. I should have put that on the list, but the Abortion Diary podcast, um, which is started by a Latina who was very, um, had an abortion and felt like it was something she couldn't talk about. And it was actually the not talking about it that she felt like harmed her the most. And it was the silence and the shame um, and having to hold that shame silently that was the most harmful for her. And so she created this podcast where people share their abortion stories in the cultural context and you know, however their understanding of it is as a way of speaking more and more about what this experience is like. So I see, um, I see a number of publications that are turning towards that. I also see that um, uh, I see that as really important work because I think that when certain medical procedures are, are sort of seen as undiscussable or un, can't be talked about or are so deeply taboo, right? All kinds of stuff is, all kinds of violence can happen under the surface. So I see this move to be more explicit and to centering the lives of those most impacted from their own perspectives, right? Because I think that's the power of intersectionality is from the voices and the lived learning from the lived experiences of those who are at the margins and the intersections. Um, and that those who maybe are only experiencing one axis of oppression may not be able to see as clearly as those who are experiencing multiple forms of oppression. And so turning to those voices, this sort of standpoint of epistemology or, um, or, or concepts of intersectionality, um, are really right women of color feminist um, black feminist um, testimony and um, and a long scholarly tradition of kind of testimony or speaking truth based on lived experience so I hope I'm answering this but I I feel like the move here is is the critical piece and I think that calling it abortion is critical um, more and more people to talk about having abortion what that looks like um, because it, there's a lot of different kinds of abortion out there. Um, and there are ways in which people have different cultural practices around abortion um, that I think is absolutely critical to bring to the front. There's lots of work here for folks that are interested in doing scholarship or research, oral histories, um, interviews, focus groups, great methodologies to help people to really have the space to talk about what their experiences are. Thanks for that question. Uh, Darlene Clark Hine and her examination of um, Black women and rape uh, talks about it as a culture of dissemblance. She offers us that warning that we should uh, cultivate spaces where women can be protected and supported as they're trying to work through these traumas. Um, uh, but we also should be cautious about only doing so in a, those silent spaces, right? Um, and so as Ayala Van Zant says, we need to call a thing a thing. So I do agree that the uh, sort of SMA group should call it out, give it a name, sort of set aside that respectability politics, right? Um, Aaron has a question and this will be our last question, uh, unless anyone else has uh, any sort of final observations. Since you mentioned sterilization, uh, many women who want to be sterilized are denied and are told to wait until they have children. Some doctors even ask that uh, married women get permission from their husbands to be sterilized. In your research and activism into reproductive justice, have you encountered if certain races or groups are denied sterilization procedures more than others? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, there are some great histories of sterilization that have shown how this medical practice, medical procedure has been differentially applied or differentially understood because of, right, because of doctors and hospital policies, perspectives on who are valid mothers, who are not valid mothers, and what is the context. So it's absolutely true that some of the history has been oftentimes more privileged women, white women, economically secure, heterosexual, um, that have wanted to be able to access sterilization, especially if they haven't had any children. Um, and they know that they don't wanna have any children, that to be able to access sterilization has been challenging. And so oftentimes, um, historically, some women um, have fought for easier access to sterilization. And then at the same time, we've also seen women of color who have been more exposed to the harm of forced sterilization, arguing for waiting periods, arguing for deeper forms of informed consent um, as a way to protect. So we could see even within like a big umbrella sort of feminist movement or gender politics movement that there have been divisions or different perspectives. And in part, right, I think this is where some of the reproductive justice movement literally comes out of this debate around sterilization. Because again, this question about who has access to sterilization versus who may be forced into it and then who do we center right because this is sort of like competing demands who do we center in and how do we as a movement or as organizations how do we how do we move behind this when different groups of women are advocating um, for what might appear to be contrasting policies right fewer restrictions to sterilization more restrictions and um, safeguards to um, to uh, sterilization. And again, I think it was Rosario, right? I, I think that the move here is like, who are we gonna center? And I think it is critical um, to think about those who are experiencing or who are positioned to experience the most harm and that those needs need to be prioritized, I would argue personally, above those who are already experiencing the most forms of social privilege or social entitlement. Um, that said, um, this is an issue, right? And I, I think that this is where, at first it may appear that these are opposing, but I think that on deeper analysis, you can see how there's, there is a combination of sort of a white supremacist and patriarchal view at play here, that there are larger forces that are dictating what women can do to their bodies. And oftentimes those who are most impacted are not at the decision-making levels in terms of those that are dictating policy, those at the highest levels of hospital administration that are coming up with the policies. So in a sense, in different ways, both of these groups are experiencing forms of patriarchy, forms of heteropaternalism, and forms of white supremacy. And I would, my, my argument would be, rather than to see these as conflicting, to think about ways in which coalitions can form across difference to ensure that the most, and especially the most marginalized, can be protected, while also continuing to fight against uh, forces of patriarchy, forces of white supremacy, the differentially value and assign the differentially assigned value to women's lives and their reproductive capacities right that that differential that hierarchy of value that's the fight is against that that, that would be my argument I hope I'm answering I hope thank I'm answering you. that it's a real it's a real question I agree thank you so much Dr. McWay we really appreciate you this has been very thoughtful and engaging uh, once again we will have the recording available through the Center for Civic Engagement I will also update your list to include the abortion diary podcast as a, a reference source for it. all of you who are interested um, both of those items will be available uh, Phil is do we still have Philip Dawson here with us I think it's Phil still here. I'm still here. Oh, that, okay. Hi, Phil. Uh, do you mind um, sharing how our audience members can access the recordings? The recordings are posted at the Hofstra University YouTube page. So if you search at YouTube, you should find it. But it won't be there immediately. It should take a couple days. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate everyone for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of our festivities. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Uh, Thank you, Dr. McWay. You have Thank a great you. day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ethelene. Thank you, Phil.